Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's Day service. We are grateful that God has allowed us to meet and to worship him. Let me begin by asking us to turn to Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32. The text given with the assumption that repentance has been done and the Lord has made promises to bless them and that their responsibility is to worship him. Joel chapter 2 verse 28 to 32. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. And in that context, we are called by the empowering grace of the Holy Spirit to worship. Let's pray. Thank you, our Father in heaven, for this Lord's Day. We are grateful that it is the day that you have made. We plead the guidance, the empowering grace, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit among us in all that we do, in the reading of your word, in our singing, in our listening to the notices, in the preaching of your word. Thank you for the activities that have taken place. We plead now that you guide us, each one. Commend those on the way that you'd undertake for them, that they'll be in this place in good time, that together, our fathers, a congregation of your people, we will corporately worship your great name. Forgive us our trespasses, even as we come before your throne of mercy. Do this because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me invite us to stand and sing our opening hymn and also invite the praise team uh, to come up and uh, lead us in the singing. As we gather, may your spirit work within us. Uh, the opening hymn, as is appearing in the title, is different. What is appearing in the title and focus on the order the hymn here. <clears throat> May I please urge the congregation to sing as loudly and as enthusiastically as you can.
works on the, this thing doesn't seem to be working properly. We come to the segment when we listen to the notices and we listen attentively and that we will make these notices points of action uh, but also points of prayer. May I invite Batembo Mathias uh, to come and lead us in the notices. Good morning, church. Good morning. A special welcome to all of us as we meet together, but special recognition that as a church, normally we are blessed with visitors Sunday after Sunday, and so we are grateful to you if you are here as a visitor that feel welcome. It is our tradition that we request our visitors to stand so that we can welcome them as a church. Those who are visiting with us, may I request that you stand where you are so that we may welcome you. Well, ushers will give you a slip of paper. Please re-indicate information about you. Keep that slip. At the end of the service, we'll be told where we'll be able to meet with you. Church, let's welcome our visitors. If you get the brochure, please turn at the back of the brochure. Some of the notices are on that brochure. Today, um, Broadway Cell Group is taking care of visitors. Next Sunday, it is Monk Fountain Cell Group. So just take note of that program. <clears throat> On Sunday, the program starts with a Bible study at 8.30 in the church hall and in the sanctuary. Uh, in the church hall, it is the youths who are usually there, and then in the sanctuary, the adults. And the Sunday school block, the Sunday school children are there also for their classes. Then 9.30 we meet in the main sanctuary for the main service. And then we have the, an evening service at 17 hours. Just take note that you are expected to be here to worship our God at 17 hours for the evening service. On Tuesdays there are cell group meetings that take place in various localities. If you check on the brochure itself at the bottom on the right hand side, there is a table showing zone and cell group address where in the area the cell group meets. We encourage you to participate in those meetings because it's a time of fellowship and also learning together from God's work. We pray for God's work and we have two times of prayer in terms of corporate meetings. On Thursday 17.30 for an hour we pray together to remember that this is Unlike politics, politics you could just have to find a gimmick with that you can beat your friend. But not so with the devil. We need to pray because we need God to be at work in order to ensure that things go according to God's purpose. So on Thursday, 17.30 for an hour, the time of prayer. And if you can't make it on Thursday, Saturday, seven hours, there's a prayer meeting that takes place here at church. And we are grateful that... Those who have been consistent will continue to remember the work of the Lord before, before him. As we indicated that it, we have two months that have been dedicated to Thanksgiving. We, that was May and June. So we still in June recognize that it's a Thanksgiving month in which we give to the Lord related to Thanksgiving and be available for other areas of ministry so that we can be able to show gratitude before our God. Then the other notices which are not on the list, you know, elder on duty this week is Elder Shilaluka, and deacon on duty is Dr. Hachizov. But the other notices which are not on the brochure are that uh, Elder Mwira is not around, he has not been feeling well in the week, let's pray for him. We thank God that the wife is feeling much better now so that we can continue to pray. Elder Nonde is preaching at Indotech this morning. We thank God for that opportunity of ministry. Then there is the NBC Missions Conference, which we announced will take place on Saturday 11th of June. Just take note that it will take place from 09 hours to 14 hours. 09 hours to 14 hours. And the subject or the theme is Every Christian a missionary. 
every Christian a missionary. And Dr. Phil Hunt will be the speaker. Dr. Phil Hunt, many of us know him uh, from Kitwe, this is a Central Africa Baptist Un uh, University. So let's prepare to come for the meeting, which will be very enriching in our pursuit of missions work here at Ndura Baptist Church. Then there was also Africa Pastors Conference. If you check on the membership platform, it has been posted with more details. This will take place 16th and 17th of June, and the, the venue is Christian Miracle Center in, in, next to Rubuto Baptist Church. That's where it will take place, and the registration is 150 to, to, at that conference. Please see Pastor for more details if you'd like to participate in that conference. We are also reminding that the membership class, for those that would like to transfer their membership to this church, membership class starts on the 12th on Sunday morning, so you can register. So far, two people have registered. You can register with any of the elders so that we can be able to know who are supposed to be there. There is a baptism class which has been running, so let's just take note that for those that have been thinking of the baptism, there's a class that has been running. Let's just come to the Lord in prayer over some of these items. Our eternal loving Father in heaven, we are grateful to you that we can gather together and lift our eyes to the throne of grace because we know that you are the one who is sovereign over all matters. Each day that we see it's because you give us breath. We thank you, Creator God, that we created for a purpose. And as you created us for a purpose, it is our desire to know and experience the blessing of worshiping you because we know the chief end of man is to we worship you and glorify you so that we can be able to enjoy the blessing of knowing God. We know that in this world, Father, there are many things that distract us from the reality of why we exist. Yet we are mindful that in times such as this, we can count the blessings of having revealed the Lord Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Grant us the blessing of following him through the forgiveness of our sins. We confess that many times we stray in our thoughts, in our actions, in our attitudes. Forgive our hearts, even as we open our hearts to you. Forgive our sins, dear Lord. Because our hearts may be deceptive in many ways of thinking that we are right with you. Yet in our communion with you, we desire nothing to hinder your presence with us. We would like to experience the blessing of your word upon our hearts, even as it will be proclaimed. We thank you for those of our friends who have been unwell, whom we continue to uphold before you. Even as we think of Weodamwira, we pray that you touch him and heal him. There are those that we continue to uplift before you, and those that are dear to us in the families who are unwell at this point. Hear our humble cry, dear Lord, so that, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, as we cry out to you, do not pass us by. Hear our humble cry that you may respond to our needs. Thank you even for the gift of children as we think of our children in this church. We pray for each one of them, surround them with your presence and protection. Above all, we pray that you bring them to salvation through your word. Father, we trust, entrust the parenting of these children to you because we know it is not an easy task, yet you have commanded us to be responsible, not only as parents, even as a church, that we may be responsible to ensure that your word is proclaimed to them. Thank you that we can commit the teachers in your hands that go before them as they undertake the ministry in every way. We bring before you even the missions conference that we shall have, that draw our hearts, that we will be prepared to be available. We pray for the speaker, grant them your blessing. Father, we also pray even for the pastor's conference that is being announced, that you go before them in all the arrangements that are going on. Lord, we can't help it, but pray for the ministries of this church that you bless us, that those leading the ministries, those leading the Bible studies will know the blessing of your presence. Help us to continue in worship and praise as we surrender ourselves to you and our minds so that we be captive, captivated by the realization that you are present with us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, uh, the Tembo. The Apostle Paul, in writing to Timothy, 
he exhorts him not to neglect the public reading of the scriptures. In obedience of that exhortation, we'll invite by Herbert to come and lead us in the public reading of the scriptures of Badiah chapter 1. morning church our reading today comes from the book of Abadea the book of Abadea is in between the book of Amos and Jonah I commence reading the vision of Obadiah. This is what the sovereign Lord says about Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord. An envoy was sent to the nations to say, Rise, let us go against her for battle. See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home on the heights. You who say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like the eagle and make your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers in the night, oh, what a disaster awaits you. Would they not steal only as, as much as they wanted? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? But Esau will be ransacked, his hidden treasure pillaged. All your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat your bread will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. In that day, declares the Lord, will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, those of understanding in the mountains of Esau? Your warriors, Teman, will be terrified, and everyone in Esau's mountains will be cut down in the slaughter. Because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with a shame, with shame. You will be destroyed forever. On the day you stood aloof while strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune, nor rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor boast so much in the day of their trouble. You should not march through the gates of my people in the day of their disaster, nor gloat over them in their calamity, in the day of their disaster, nor seize their wealth. In the day of their disaster, you should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives, nor hand over their survivors in the day of their trouble. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and Jacob will possess his inheritance. Jacob will be a fire, and Joseph a flame. Esau will be stubble, and they will set him on fire and destroy him. 
There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau, and the people from the foothills will possess the land of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. This company of Israelite ex exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zerath. The exiles from Jerusalem who are in Sephard will possess the towns of the Negev. Deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Ends the reading. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word and to the hearing of his word. Okay. Um, we always seem to hesitate uh, when the one who has read the scriptures either say amen or the Lord add a blessing to his word. We're kind of not sure. Uh, we can say a thunderous amen uh, if we desire that what we have read uh, should take place. Verse 15, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations, and if the day is near, judgment will come. What therefore is our role, missions, outreach, calling out to the lost, in that context, may I please emphasize that the missions conference on Saturday is for all members of Undola Baptist Church, all of them. Our children, if they are able to come, bring them. Our youths, uh, come. It's not for Dr. Zimba, it's for all of us. At nine hours to Skistin, please do come. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. Our assignment, missions. Missions, missions. Why did God send the Holy Spirit to empower us to be witnesses? Missions, missions, missions. Please set aside Saturday 11th. Uh, it's Indola Baptist Missions Conference. It will be the second uh, since the inauguration uh, meeting. May I also encourage us uh, that the APC sounds a little misleading. Africa Pastors Conference, it rightly must be called Teachers Conference. If you are a Sunday school teacher, a youth teacher, men who teach, it's your conference. If for any reason you must attend its books, uh, there is no conference in which you find books as cheap as they are. Please do read the details. I would encourage you to attend. And the thrust of it is dividing the word of God rightly. Uh, whether you are a woman, Sunday school teacher, in whatever capacity you teach, you have no prerogative to teach your own dreams. Uh, you are required to teach God's word. And this conference will be addressing uh, that subject matter. Very quickly, may I say to the youths, I think the Ndola District Youth Leadership has been in communication. Uh, there is a conference during that week. Uh, please do have in mind, just like we invite people to come, when they don't come, the conference fails. I think they have extended an invitation. Uh, let's make an effort to attend from the 10th, 11th uh, through to the 12th. We can designate what days we attend. And the theme of that conference is uh, a youth as a good example. With that uh, digression, uh, may I call us to sing in response to the public reading of scripture Give me oil in my life, keep me burning. And if you're able to stand, please do stand as we sing in response uh, to the reading of Obadiah uh, chapter 1. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Trusting that's your prayer. Uh, if you sing it and don't mean the words, 
It's called hypocrisy. Uh, please do not sing if you don't sincerely mean that prayer. great singing. We read in Deuteronomy 16 verse 10, then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with a tribute of free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks of the Lord your God with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. Response to the goodness of God, both in giving thanks, tithes and offering, we do that in worship of God as we sing and give to him. Take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to you. I think it was announced if it's a thanksgiving indicate and we know how we give tithes and offering but we are giving because of the Lord's blessings and we sing while seated and ushers we wait upon us. Take my life and let it be.
Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for the many blessings that you've installed upon us. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of family and friends and uh, the many other things that we have. Father, we want to bless you by giving and bringing these tithes and blessings to you that you may bless them to the glory of your name. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, before we do read the parallel scripture, uh, just in case you're wondering, uh, is pastor still on leave or is come back? Has he done something wrong? So he's being punished for chairing the service. Uh, no leave ended. Uh, but I'm grateful somebody came to the office and said, why did the elders give you one month? After all the problems we give you, we should have given you six months. And I said, please speak to the elders. It's a glorious blessing uh, for such a membership. Uh, so pastor is back from leave. Uh, he is no longer on leave. Please do turn to Acts in chapter 2. Uh, the schedule says we'll read the whole chapter, but allow me to read from verse 1 to 21. And after I've read, we will sing the hand over him. And after the hand over him, I will invite Dr. Zimba uh, to come and introduce our speaker. Uh, please, uh, uh, just in case you're thinking, these Americans, is that the attire they preach in? We didn't tell him that we wear suits here. Uh, I think the next time he's around, he will be in a suit. Uh, so I apologize on his behalf. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 1 to 21. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire spread on them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretan and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on male servants and female servants in those days, I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I'll show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
I invite us to stand. As I indicated, after we've sung, we'll sit. Dr. Zimba will come and then introduce our preacher, but also pray for him. Please do stand if you are able as we sing, all oh, spread the tidings round. Missions, missions, missions. <laughs>
seated. May I please sincerely encourage us to pay attention in the next 40, 50 years. We have two home churches. In Zambia, it's Ndola Baptist Church. In America, it's Grace Fellowship Church. So whenever we are there, we always meet. And uh, uh, my brother here, good teacher, and I want him to speak for himself. He came, he joined Grace when he was single. Now he's, um, he's loaded, uh, which, is, uh, <laughs> which is great. So I want him to tell about himself. I have many things to say about him, but when they come from his mouth, uh, you will believe me at the end. And uh, let's pray for him. Father, we thank you. Uh, we give you glory for your loving kindness. Pray that God you uh, anoint my brother, that God even as he speaks, may you speak to us through him. Be with him, give them the eloquence he needs. Pray and ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. And by the way, as we were driving, coming up, that's when I reminded him, I said, oh, by the way, we are Baptists. <laughs> and you know what it means. So, my brother. <laughs> well, good morning. It is great to be here with you all. It's such an honor to be here. Uh, we arrived from California on Friday. Uh, I think my time right now, it's about 1 a.m., so if anyone's allowed to sleep this morning, it's our three daughters, but otherwise the rest of you have to stay awake for this. Um, but it's so amazing to be here. You know, I, we come from just about the opposite side of the world, and we can come here this morning, and we were singing songs that I was singing at five years old. Uh, Give me oil for my lamp, take my life. I've known those songs my whole life, and it's, it's a rich experience to meet with you all and have that unity in Christ, uh, in these common songs and this worship together. So it is wonderful to be here. So as Dr. Zima said, uh, I grew up in California after college. I went to seminary, and after that, I started working at Grace Fellowship Church. And I came to that church, and there was a man there that you all know as Dr. Zimba. And we shared just about six months on staff before the Zimbas came back to Zambia. And I've been there ever since. I've been uh, I guess almost 20 years uh, in pastoral ministry, which has been just a true delight and joy. And um, what's fun is this is actually not my first time in your church. So about 17 years ago, 2005, we took a, a small team here and we got to worship with you. Dr. Zima was, was in my place on that Sunday and we were just staying just right down the street. Just this morning we were driving up. I said, I remember walking down this street and uh, coming here and uh, then I was a uh, young man in my late 20s, single, and uh, here I am 17 years later. Did you say I'm loaded? Is that what I heard you say? <laughs> I'm loaded. Um, my wife, Carrie, we've been married for about 15 years. We have three daughters, Adele, Cora, and Josie. Okay, they're 10, 8, and 6. I'm going to share something you'll never forget. This is the only part of my sermon you'll remember in two years, all right? All three of my girls, 10, 8, and 6, are all born on the same day. They all have July 21st birthdays, so it just happened that way. We don't know what it means, but it means something, so uh, the Lord will reveal that at some point uh, in time, uh, but we're just honored to be here, and it's a true a joy and blessing. So this morning is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, this is a day where churches around the world are celebrating the gift of the Holy Spirit um, that we just read about in Acts 2. And the good news of our Lord is really twofold. Most important, importantly, it's the good news that God sent his one and only son, right, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, uh, to live a perfect, sinless life, and uh, to offer a perfect sacrifice for sin and to bring about forgiveness. That is the heart of the gospel. But the second part of the gospel is this, that God not only sent his son, but he also sent his spirit to do in us what we could never do for ourselves, to change our hearts, to rewire us, to reorient us towards God so that we worship him. We sang that, that, that song, give me oil, keep me burning. 
Okay, what is that oil? That oil is the Holy Spirit who speaks through the word of God to us and changes our hearts. And so today we get to celebrate Pentecost. We celebrate the gift of the Spirit. And I understand that you guys have been talking about the Spirit uh, this year. So I'm honored that my, my day just happened to fall on uh, Pentecost Sunday. Uh, I want to apologize if you can't ex- uh, kind of understand what I'm saying sometimes. Uh, I'm not speaking in tongues like they were that first week. This is my accent. I'm used to being on the other side of this when Dr. Zimba comes and speaks. And people said, what was that word he said? Uh, was that, what was banana? I said, no, no, he said banana. It's a banana. He's from Zambia. So I apologize if uh, you don't understand my accent at times. Zambia and banana. It sounds so much better the way you guys say it. But I can't help myself. This is who I am. This is who the Lord made me. So let's take some time to talk about the Spirit today as we see him in this passage. So a little background. Uh, Pentecost, that was an annual Jewish feast uh, every year. They celebrated that. Penta means 50. Uh, Pentecost was a feast that was celebrated 50 days after Passover. So this is about 50 days uh, after um, Jesus died, right, on uh, Passover week. And it was an annual feast, and it also came to be associated with the giving of the law at Mount Sinai because God led Israel out of Egypt, right? And he did that during the Passover, the slaughtering of the Passover lamb. And then about 50 days after that, they ended up in the, in the wilderness at Sinai, and Moses went up that mountain and received God's law. So it was an annual feast. It was uh, about a week long. And so if you look in our passage in verse 5, it says, There were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. People had come from all over the place to celebrate one of the annual feasts. And in verse 1, it tells us, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. The they there is uh, at least the 12 disciples minus Judas Iscariot. Uh, There may have been some of the other disciples, the men and women who had Uh, come uh, with Jesus uh, before his death to Jerusalem. And uh, they are gathered in one place. And Jesus had told them, just before he went back to heaven, he said, I want you to remain in the city. And I want you to wait. And something's going to happen. You're going to be clothed with power. And so that's what they were doing. They're in this room, and uh, I imagine they were praying And they were waiting, and they probably didn't even understand what they were waiting for. But then something happens, doesn't it? The Spirit of God is poured out on them. And they start speaking in tongues, right? They're declaring the praises of God in all these different human languages. Because there's all these people from all these different countries there who speak all these different languages. And so they are declaring the praises of God so that all can understand what is taking place. And of course, you just heard the scripture read, but uh, people are confused about this. They say there's a scene. Who knows? What are these people? Are they babbling? Are they drunk? What's going on? And Peter speaks into the moment. And he says, no, this is what's going on. And if you look at verse 17, he quotes from Joel. This is being fulfilled in the last days. This is verse 17. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. In the Old Testament, the spirit was still there, but you'd see him poured out just on particular people for particular tasks. The kings, right, would be anointed with the spirit. The prophets would be anointed with the spirit for a particular task. But there was a day that would come when all of God's people, men and women, young and old, servants and wealthy, everybody would receive the Spirit of God. And Peter says, that day has come today. And it ends in verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so that's what happens. Peter preaches this beautiful sermon and people are cut to the quick and they say, what should we do? And he says, repent and be baptized, and you'll be forgiven of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. It's for all who call on the name of the Lord. And 3,000 people on this day become Christians, are brought into the kingdom. Powerful movement of the Spirit. 
And what I want to do this morning, uh, we're not going to walk verse by verse through this passage, but I want to look at four images that we see of the Holy Spirit in this passage. Four almost physical descriptions. And each description helps us understand a little bit about who the Spirit is and the kinds of things He does in our lives today. So I want to talk through these images, and um, hopefully you can imagine these. I want you to bring your imagination today, all right? Use your minds. The images we see are first, wind, second, fire, third, water, and fourth, tongues, okay? I want to talk about each of these images and and what they might tell us about who the Spirit is and how He works in our lives today. All right, so the first image we see is the image of wind, right? Look at verse 2. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. A wind blows. And in the biblical languages, there's only one word for wind and spirit and breath, okay? In English, we have three words. It's all one word. So when you see wind, that's the exact same word that is translated as spirit later. Now, I want, you to te- I want to teach you the Hebrew word for wind or spirit, all right? Now, this was written in Greek, first, cent- first century, but the Old Testament's written in Hebrew. I'm going to need you to participate with me, okay? You've got to learn a word today. So the word is ruach, okay? Why don't you say that with me? Ruach. All right, now I want you to sound really Hebrew. So you really got to get, kind of get the throat going. Ruach. All right, and if you really extend it, it kind of sounds like the wind. Ruach. One more time. Ruach. Right? You hear the wind blowing through this place? The ruach is the creative, transforming, but invisible power of God moving in this world. So in Southern California, uh, we don't get a a strong breeze. It's a pretty light breeze. But about five times a year, we get another breeze. We call it the Santa Ana winds. You guys would call it the Santa Ana winds. And uh, about five times a year, these winds come in from the mountains inland and they just blow. And you can go to sleep, and it's perfectly calm, and you wake up the next day, and there are leaves everywhere because the, the wind has been blowing, howling all night, and stuff happens when wind blows. You can't see the wind, right? But you can see the effects of the wind. And that's like the Spirit. He is the invisible power of God. You can't see Him. But when He starts blowing, things happen. I want you to think about the Spirit throughout Scripture. Okay, he's actually there right at the creation. Remember the very creation account, Genesis 1.1, right? In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And then verse 2 says this, Now the earth was formless and void, and there was darkness over the surface of the waters, and the ruach of God was hovering over the waters. In the beginning, before the world had been shaped and formed, the ruach, of God was there, and then God's ruach blows, and God speaks, and creation happens, right? Order, light and darkness, land and sky, right? Land and sea, the ruach, transforming power of God. Genesis 2, God makes the Garden of Eden, right? He places a man in in Eden, and it says this, God took some dust, and he formed a man out of dust, And then remember what he does? And then it says God breathed his ruach into the man. And the man became a living being. Just a lump of dust until the ruach blows and he comes to life. It is the creative transforming power of God, especially to do things that no human effort alone could ever do. Right? So we've just been going through the book of Exodus back home. Exodus 14, famous passage. Finally, after the 10 plagues in Egypt, Moses leads the people out right after Passover. And they come to the Red Sea. And then Pharaoh changes his mind, right? And he sends his army. And the Israelites are there. And there's the Red Sea on one side. And there's the army. And they're stuck. And they have nowhere to go. And then Moses says, 
Don't worry, the Lord will fight for you. And then the text says, all night long, the ruach of God blowed on the sea. And the ruach blew back the waters. And God made a way where there was no way, where no human being ever could have made a way. The Spirit of God, the wind of God, made a way to safety. Later in Ezekiel, last one, Ezekiel 37 Israel, after hundreds of years in the promised land, were unfaithful. They didn't obey God. They pursued other gods. And so just as God had promised, he sent them into exile. They were taken into Babylon. They were living as slaves in exile. But in that time, Ezekiel had a vision of hope. It was a vision of Israel. He saw a vision, a, a, a desert valley that was covered with nothing but, but bones. They were dry bones, just piles of bones. And that, those piles represented Israel because Israel was hopeless. They were spiritually dead. They were slaves in a foreign land. And then the vision says this, and then the ruach, the wind, the breath of God came. And God commanded Ezekiel, speak to the breath, prophesy to the breath. And the ruach started moving and these bones started connecting with one another. They stood up and then flesh and hair and fingernails all connected with them. And this valley of bones became a mighty army of God. This beautiful picture that God's spirit was going to breathe new life into Israel and bring them back into the land. In the New Testament, of course, Jesus speaks of the Ruach of God. John 3 Jesus and Nicodemus, you guys know the story? There's a famous verse you might know that comes from this story, John 3.16. I assume that's as famous in Zambia as it is in America. Yes? But Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus. And he says, you have to be born again. You can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And Nicodemus says, how can this be? And Jesus clarifies. He says, what I mean by that is you need to be born of water and you need to be born of ruach. The Spirit of God has to blow. The wind has to blow inside your hearts and minds because apart from that, we're spiritually dead. Until the Spirit blows in our hearts and changes us, we come alive like those bones. We come to believe in the gospel. All that to say the Ruach, that wind communicates the Spirit. He's invisible, but he is the transforming, creative power of God in this world to do what no human being can do on their own. And this is what God's Spirit does in our own lives today. Amen? Amen. Right? His Spirit is there to bring new life, to blow, to make things happen spiritually in us that we couldn't do on our own. And of course, if you're here and you are a Christian, you owe that to the Spirit of God as Jesus says, because at some point in our lives, we were going through life, and it was like our lives were stagnant. And then the Spirit blew, right? And he brought new life, and we were born again. And even on our Christian journey now, every day of our lives, we owe every act of transformation that happens to God's Spirit. All right, we're living our lives, and then God's Spirit works in a fresh way, and we find newness, we find a change. We find new power, new perspective. He brings healing and transformation. And before we move on to the second image, I just want to ask you, consider right now, so, sorry, when was the last time the spirit, the wind, blew in your life? When was the last time you feel like God did something fresh and new? It may have been this morning in worship. It may have been this week. Uh, maybe it was, it was a year ago. But he's always up to something. He's always blowing and breathing in our lives. But when was the last time you tasted the Ruach of God? I was thinking about that for myself, and this isn't the last time, but I'll share a story from my own life where the, the, the Spirit of God just breathed newness. And this story has to do with my, my marriage to my wife, Carrie. And I think we have a pretty good marriage. We don't have a perfect marriage. Uh, any perfect marriages in the room? Anybody? No? Okay. Fair enough. Um, but we had, a, we had a dynamic for years 
that was subtle, um, but was, uh, I think my wife, there was a bit where she felt um, that, there, that I held sort of a critical attitude towards her. And this wasn't things that I actually said. You wouldn't, if you'd have watched this, you probably wouldn't have seen it, but she, there was a sense that, that she somehow wasn't living up to some expectation I had of who she was supposed to be. And I kind of denied it. I, I said, no, I, yeah, this is great. And I, I didn't believe that and didn't really think that, and, or at least didn't want to admit that. And, um, and one day I was spending just a couple hours alone, and uh, I was on a walk, and I had my Bible. And I just kind of just did, you know, don't ever do this. It's a horrible idea, but I did just one of these, you know. And uh, I happened to turn to Ephesians 5. And Ephesians 5 is that passage about husbands and wives. And it says to husbands, it says, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, right, to make her holy with the washing through the word. And I've read that verse a hundred times. But on that day, the Ruach of God <laughs> breathed through that passage into my heart. And I was convicted and confronted that, surprise, surprise, my wife was right. That there was a spirit of criticism. And I think for me, I'm generally not a critical person of people, but I'm fairly critical of myself. And I realized that my wife had to bear the brunt of that self-criticism as well. And I realized she was right. There was... There was a subtle and unspoken criticism. And the Spirit of God in that moment, like, just convicted me. And then in the next moment, totally freed me. I thought, is my wife's experience of me an experience of the grace and forgiveness of Jesus? And I realized, no, it's not a lot of the time. And is that, I don't want that for her. <laughs> I want that, I want my wife to have experience of grace and forgiveness. And it wasn't that. And I was convicted and I was freed, and I, I, uh, I didn't tell her right away about it. I sat on it for about a month, um, but I'll never forget. We were on a drive together on a trip where uh, that issue came up, and I got to share that with her, and um, she started crying. I started crying, and it was just this sweet moment of, of healing and, and, and just redemption for us, but my point is, you know, I'd read that verse so many times, but sometimes, and you've all experienced it, hopefully, the Ruach just starts blowing, and, and, and there's, a, there's, there's a transforming power that he brings. And so my prayer is that you experience that. They certainly experienced that on that first Pentecost. All right, so that's the first image, image of wind. Let's look at the second image we see in this passage, the image of fire. Look at verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Okay? So first wind and now fire. Fire, I think, is the, the, the wild but purifying presence of God. And just as with the wind, if you look back in Scripture, you'll see that regularly the presence of God in Scripture is associated with fire. Okay? So most originally, Exodus 3, Moses, right? The call of Moses. Moses at the time was a shepherd in Midian. And he was shepherding the flock in the desert by Mount Sinai. And what did he see? He saw a bush that was burning, right? It was a fiery bush, but it didn't burn it up. And it was the presence of God coming in the fire to Moses, and the first thing that, that God said to Moses was this, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. And I think fire, there's something about fire that represents the holy, purifying presence of God. Of course, throughout Israel's journeys in the wilderness, God would kind of lead them through a a pillar of fire, right? A cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. When they arrive together at Mount Sinai, God shows up at Mount Sinai in a huge mountain of fire. The top of the mountain is set on fire. God speaks his 10 commandments from the fire. And then in the New Testament as well, the presence of God comes to be associated with fire. Here in, in uh, Acts 2, 
And then all the way at the end in Revelation 4, John has a vision of heaven. He sees a throne room and God seated on his throne. And it says this, Before the throne were seven lamps that were blazing, and these are the sevenfold spirit of God. So fire represents the, the powerful, purifying presence of God. Now in California, um, unfortunately over the last especially 10 to 15 years, every fall, so September through in October for us, that is the dry season. And we get these massive fires that will come through. So fire can be wild and fire can be uh, a devastating thing. And we, we see these every season nowadays, and it's, it's a sad thing. But I think the point here is there's something purifying about fire. I want you to think about fire. You know, f- fire will take something that's superficial and just burn it up, right? I mean, you take a newspaper, you take cardboard, you throw it into fire, and it just, it burns it up, right? But fire can also take more, more permanent things like steel, like gold, things that are more permanent. And fire takes those, and what it does with those is it purifies them. It, it burns away the imperfections, right? The other metals, the dirt, and, and those more, more permanent things come through fire purified. But nothing goes through fire unscathed. It either gets burned up or it gets purified. And that is one of the roles the Spirit plays in our lives, isn't it? He brings the purifying presence of God. He is called the Holy Spirit. And he enters our lives to make us holy, just as he is holy. And so what he does is he takes things in us that are superficial, priorities that are not his, and he burns them up. He wants to just burn them up and remove them. But he takes other things, the things that are important, that are more permanent values, and he purifies them. He refines them so that they become even more pure. And I want you to think about this. You know, God sees right into our hearts, right? God's spirit searches hearts and minds. This morning, wherever your heart is, wherever your mind is, whether your mind is here or whether your mind is somewhere else, God sees it. And what does he see when he looks inside our hearts and minds? So if you're like me, he sees a mixture of things. He sees a desire for God. He sees a a, a love for God's word. He sees a hunger to, to love and serve. Uh, But he also sees other things in there, doesn't he? He sees other uh, desires, other attachments to other things. He sees distractions, whether that is just distraction with entertainment, uh, distraction by by wanting to be more wealthy than we are, whether we have a desire for human praise and approval. He sees all sorts of things in there. He sees lust. He sees greed. He sees anxiety. He sees selfishness. He sees pride. And the Spirit's role, is to enter our lives and begin to burn away those other things and to purify so that we're freed from those other desires, other attachments, and we come away more hungry for God, more pure in our passion. We're, we say in America, I'm on fire for God. Do you guys say that here? I'm on fire for God, right? Lord, give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning. Keep me on fire for God. And that's the Spirit's role. We can't do that on ourselves. I can't create passion out of nothing, but the Spirit can enter my life, free me from my sin, and give me a more self, or a more uh, God-focused orientation in my life. And when the Spirit is at work in our lives, that's what happens. We want more of God. We want more of God's goodness, God's holiness, and we want to love and serve people the way Jesus served. That's what the Spirit does in our lives. And I trust that you all, in various ways, have had moments where you experience God's fire purifying you, giving him a deeper hunger for you. I was reminded this week of a friend of mine who experienced the purifying fire of God's spirit. A friend of ours named Travis. And uh, Travis uh, is a guy, he's about my age, goes to our church. And Travis had a really tough childhood. Um, He actually was uh, in an orphanage in Eastern Europe and then was adopted and came to America at a young age. 
But very early on, Travis uh, got involved in some really uh, not good stuff. He got into alcohol. He got into drugs. Uh, he was a violent man. He uh, worked for some, some tough people. He would be paid to hurt people, to get money out of people. Uh, he was a dangerous man. He was a very broken man. Uh, he was arrested several times. And one time, on one of his arrests, he was handcuffed. He was put in the back of a police car. And this was not a Christian man. But in the back of a police car, the Spirit of God spoke into his heart. It was not an audible voice, but in his mind, he heard from the Spirit of God. He said, when you get to jail, when you go to prison, find a Bible and start reading it, okay? The Spirit just prompted that in him. And he went to jail for a year, and he got a Bible, and he started reading. And God grabbed a hold of his heart and transformed him in prison. And he was released from prison, and we got to know him after that. And to see this man now, his heart has been purified by the fire of God's Spirit. This man has a passion for God's Word. He reads the Word more than anybody I know. And he has a passion for service. He, he loves to serve people who have addictions because that's his background. So he serves people that have been uh, without a home. He serves people that have been addicted to all sorts of things because the fire of God's Spirit purified his heart. And so hopefully we experience the purifying of the Spirit in our lives today. All right, so wind, second, fire. Third, water, which is kind of the opposite image of fire, isn't it? And this one's a little subtle. Uh, you won't see it quite as explicitly, but it's implicit. If you look at verse 33, there's sort of a metaphor of water here. This is Peter speaking. Look at verse 33. Peter says, speaking of Jesus, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and here it is, and has poured out what you now see and hear. Right? He poured out the Spirit. The Spirit is like water that is being poured out on the disciples in this moment. And so I want to think about the image of, of water. So different than fire, right? Almost opposite of fire. But it also communicates something about who the, the Spirit is and what he does in our lives. And just as with, with these other two images, you'll see this image of the Spirit as water throughout the Scriptures. So Ezekiel 36, this is one of my favorite passages in all Scripture. I'll just read it to you. You don't have to turn there. God says this is when Israel was in exile, and God promised that he would bring them back into the land. God says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's one of my favorite passages in, in, in the Bible. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And so even in the Old Testament, the Spirit came to be associated with life-giving water. Jesus said you have to be born of water and the Spirit. John the Baptist came, right? And he came baptizing people. He would dunk them in water. We're Baptists here, right? We dunk. Is it, do we dunk in this church? I want to get that one right. Yes? Do we sprinkle? We dunk. Yes? Okay. Jesus dunked. Um, he would, uh, John dunked people in water, but he said this, I baptize with water, but after me is coming one more powerful than me. He will baptize you with God's own spirit. You will be drenched. You'll be dunked. You'll be immersed in the very presence of the living God. And of course, Jesus himself in John 7 associates the spirit with water. At the, at the last day of a great feast, actually this, there was this water ceremonial that happened every day during this feast where the priests would come up from the pool. They'd carry water up into the temple and they'd pour out the water in memory of when God brought water in the wilderness to Israel. And right at that moment, Jesus stood up on this feast and he said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And then John says, by this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Jesus with the woman at the well, John 4 said, 
I can give a water that's different than the water from this well. The water that I give will become in you a spring, welling up to eternal life. And so this image of the Spirit as water, I think, communicates something about the the refreshing, the refreshment, the life-giving experience that comes from having the Spirit of God living within us. He doesn't just transform. He doesn't just purify, but he refreshes. He brings refreshment to lives that are dry and dusty. Um, I, I came to understand refreshment about five years ago in, in, in a new way. Um, it was my wife's birthday, and for her birthday, we went up to some mountains. It's about a four-hour drive from us, and uh, it's called Yosemite Valley. It's very famous in California, and we went on this hike, uh, and the hike is, it's an all-day hike. It's, a, it's called Half Dome. You go up to this beautiful granite rock at the top, and you wake up early in the morning before the sun rises because it's going to take you the whole day. And so we got going, and we, uh, we, sub, we, we, we got up. There's, there's two waterfalls on the way up. There's some rivers, and then you get past the water level, and then you have to hike the rest of the way. And uh, it was a hot, dry day, and we ran out of water um, just as we were getting to the top, I think. And so we got to the top, and we enjoyed the summit. We, we just sat out there. It's just a beautiful view for about an hour. But then we had about two or three hours on the way down before we got back to the, to the river, to the streams. And um, that was the driest two and a half hours of my life. And we, were, we, had, we had been hiking a ton. I, I had blisters on every toe. It was an ugly sight. And we were just bodies dry and parched. And finally, we came down to that, that first waterfall. And the, the, the river kind of pools at the top of the waterfall. And so you can, there's people there that are swimming. And it's, it's mountain, it's cool, refreshing. And Carrie took her shoes off and just dipped her feet in. And I just had, a, had my shorts on. And I just, I just laid in that water, that cool, refreshing water, for about a half an hour, just laying on my back, looking up, drinking water, absorbing water. And it was like to go from dry parts to just, cool and refreshing. I will never forget that experience. And that is what the Spirit comes to do in our lives, right? He is, he is the very presence of God. And he brings refreshment and, and life into our, into our lives. He's like water. So we have sing songs. You're like water to my soul, right? And sometimes our souls get thirsty, they get dry, because because we're not perfect, right? And we we pursue other things other than God. We go after the things of this world sometimes. And what turns out is those things never satisfy. We can go after them for a while, whether it's success, whether it's money, whether it's uh, popularity. uh, It could be anything. And they satisfy for a little while, but our hearts are made for God. And so those things will ultimately leave us dry, thirsty, wanting more. Our hearts are made for God. And so only God's spirit can bring true refreshment and satisfaction to the human soul. And I would ask you this morning, have you ever experienced the refreshment of the spirit in your lives? Have you had times where you're discouraged, where life feels dry, where your passion is gone? And then the spirit does a fresh work in your life, and you're refreshed. You're given hope. You're, giving, you're given encouragement again. I was thinking for myself how, how the Spirit um, has refreshed me in life, and, and I'll share with you just the way He most often refreshes me, and it might look different for every person here, um, but for me, so I grew up in the church, okay? Uh, I've been, I probably said a prayer of faith when I was five, and um, and I've been a, a pretty good kid. I was, I was a good moral kid. I didn't do any of the things that kids weren't supposed to do. And I built a bit of a, an identity for myself as, as the good kid who followed the rules and who did all the right things. Uh, but there was a danger in that for me. And the danger was, in all that goodness, I would lose sight of the gospel. And the gospel is not, you can be good enough for God. The gospel is not be a good boy, be a good girl for God. The gospel is you can't be good enough for God, but God has sent his son to do for you what you can never do for yourself. 
And for me, even as a Christian and as, you know, experiencing that gospel, it's easy for me to fall back sometimes into that place where I just think this is just about my moral efforts. It's about me being good enough and performing well enough for God. And maybe if I can do all the right things, God is going to be pleased with me. And I'll tell you, that is not a way to live. That will leave your soul thirsty and dry. That's how the Pharisees lived, trying to perform for God and for others. And what the Spirit, the way the Spirit most often refreshes me is he steps into that life of that little boy who's still trying to be good enough. And he reminds me, oh, you are a child of God, not because of anything you do, but simply because of your faith in Jesus. Because Jesus is the child of God, and you have been adopted into his family by faith. And the Spirit will usually use some passage in Scripture and speak to me through that passage and remind me, the gospel is about grace. It's about forgiveness. It is all about who God is and what he's done. And that part of me that's trying so hard to be good just kind of relaxes again. And my soul is refreshed. And I'm able just to sit back and lay back into the grace of God, kind of like I was on that hike, just laying in that, that stream. My soul lays back and I'm refreshed and reminded you are a son of God, right? Or for you, you are a daughter of God. Romans 8, Paul says, the Spirit reminds us that God is our Abba Father. The Spirit testifies to our spirits that we're children of God. That's one of the Spirit's roles is to get inside our hearts and to convince us that we are God's children, not from anything we do, but through what God has done and by faith. And that is a refreshing way to live life. That is a freeing way to live life. So I hope that you experience the life-giving refreshment of the Spirit. All right, by my count, that is three of four. So we've got one more. Wind, fire, water, and of course, on Pentecost Sunday, tongues, right? This really interesting image of tongues. Verse three says it. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So this fire comes in the shape of a human tongue. Have you ever, that's a strange, strange thing. These human tongues that are resting on, these fiery tongues that are resting on the heads of the disciples. And then of course what happens is they start speaking, right? Look at verse Where is it? Verse 11. The second half of verse 11, the people that are are gathered say, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. So the Spirit empowers these disciples to start speaking languages that they don't know. These are human languages that they've never spoken before. But the Spirit in this moment empowers them to speak. But the heart of what they're speaking is the wonders of God. Undoubtedly, they're talking about Jesus the Nazarene, and his crucifixion and his resurrection, and how he is the fulfillment of God's plan for his people. But this is the final thing that the Spirit does in our lives. He empowers us for courageous witness, mission in the world. And this fits so nicely with what your pastor already said. Mission, mission, mission. The Spirit of God is a spirit of mission. He's a missionary spirit. You know, if you go back, take a look at, um, go back to chapter 1. Look at verse 8. This is the theme verse for the book of Acts. This is before Jesus returns to heaven. He says to his disciples this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the theme of the book of Acts. Spirit-empowered witnesses. People have been empowered by the Spirit to be witnesses to all the world, beginning where they were in Jerusalem, extending out to the surrounding world, all the way to the ends of the earth. And the book of Acts ends in Rome, the very heart of the ancient world, with the gospel going out there through Paul. But what happens in Acts, most often, when the Spirit comes on somebody, 
the thing that most often happens is they start speaking. They start witnessing. They start declaring with their mouths the wonders of God. And they do it with power and with courage. So you have in our passage, chapter 2, Peter, right? There's, there's thousands of people gathered, and people and Peter stands up in that crowd, and he starts speaking. He speaks of the Spirit, and then he speaks of Jesus of Nazareth. But think about this man, Peter. This was the man who just a couple months earlier had denied even knowing Jesus. Remember that? The night before Jesus dies, three times people say, you, you sound like a Galilean. You were one of the disciples. And he says, I've never met this man. He swears, I swear to you, I've never met this man. His fear, his self-protection caught him. Now that same man is empowered by the Spirit. Now he's standing up in front of thousands of people declaring the wonders of God and saying, I'm in with Jesus. I'm associated with Jesus, empowered by the Spirit for witness. Chapter 3, if we were to go on to read, Peter and John go into the temple and they find a man there who is lame. He's asking for money. They say, we don't have any of that, but we got something a lot better. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. This man starts walking. He's jumping around, declaring the praises of God. And Peter and John are brought to the Sanhedrin, which is the the group of ruling Jewish leaders at the time. This is the same group that Jesus was brought for uh, into for his trial. And so now you have these two fishermen standing before these learned scholars, and the Spirit gives them courage to speak boldly and plainly about Jesus. Inspired witnesses. I love, there's a, there's a verse there where it says the Pharisees, they looked at these men and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, but they took note that they had been with Jesus. And these guys, compared to these religious leaders, they didn't have any training. They were just fishermen, but they had been with Jesus and the spirit was moving in them. And so they were missionaries in that moment with boldness. Chapter 7, Stephen, the first martyr of the church, he too is brought before the religious leaders, those same religious leaders, and he, the Spirit is on him, and he just starts speaking. (laughs) And he tells the whole story of Israel and what God had done from the very beginning through Israel's life up to Jesus. And with courage, he, he confronts these men. He says, you are just like the people of old who never believed in, in, God's, in God's promises and God's words. And he ends up being killed for his faith. He's stoned. And even as he's stoned, he is speaking the wonders of God. He says he looks up in heaven, he sees Jesus in heaven, and he declares it with his mouth, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And he's killed, the first martyr for witnessing to God. The Spirit is a spirit of mission and witness. He prompts people. He guides people. He places people in certain circumstances where they'll be with other folks, and then he empowers them, gives them courage to speak about the wonders of God. And then the Spirit does his work, and he brings people to faith. Let's look at one, that my, my favorite story of Spirit-empowered witness. Actually, turn to chapter 7. I love this story. I lied. Chapter 8. Verse 28. Nope, verse 26. I love this story. Let me just read it to you. This is my favorite evangelism story in the Bible. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to uh, to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandik, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone, by, uh, gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit, there's the spirit, told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. <laughs> then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. I love it. You have to picture Philip's just kind of jogging behind, you know, waiting for Spirit's orders. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. 
How can I, the man said, unless someone explains it to me. And Philip's thinking, ah, that's why I'm here. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. (laughs) This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. And this is Isaiah speaking of Jesus and prophecy. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who's the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And then the man was baptized. But I love that story of the spirit prompting Philip to go somewhere, Philip obeying, and then God putting him in that perfect circumstance, and then Philip stepping into that and relying on the Spirit, spirit speaking the gospel into this man's life. And then the Spirit grabbed a hold of this man's heart. And he became probably the first non-Jewish convert uh, in the world. He was from Ethiopia. And this is what the Spirit wants to do in our lives today. He wants to empower us to be witnesses for God, to speak the wonders of God. And the great thing is we get to do that to one another, right? We get to encourage one another every Sunday and every Monday through Saturday as well. We speak what we're learning about God, how God's encouraging us. And then, of course, we can speak that as well to our neighbors, to those who don't know Jesus. And here's the beauty. The power of the gospel is not in our words, right? I don't know about you, but I get get nervous about sharing the gospel with other people. And I think I've got to say this just right. I've got to have answers to all the questions they might ask me. Uh, And that's good to have those answers when we can, but the power is not in our words. The power is in the Spirit. We can't get inside of another person's heart and change it. Only the Spirit can do that. We're just called to step in and be faithful. It's been fun. Our our elders at our church, the theme of this year has been uh, the theme of disruption, meaning, God, how, how do you want to disrupt our lives? How do you want to disrupt our schedules? Give us eyes to see the people around us and have a heart for them and say, God, maybe you want me to just stop what I'm doing and and go into the situation and have eyes for what you're up to and then maybe have the courage to speak about what I've learned about you and to trust this. It's not up to me. It's up to you. I just want to be faithful with this and um, you bring about the results. And what I love about this passage in in chapter 2 on Pentecost, talk about results, right? That chapter ends with 3,000 people came to faith that day. And it's it's really beautiful because, as I said at the beginning, Pentecost was a a celebration of the harvest. It was the wheat harvest that they'd bring in the wheat and celebrate that. And on a day where they celebrated the harvest, the Spirit of God brought in a huge harvest harvest, not of wheat, but of souls. 3,000 people were brought into the kingdom that day because the spirit is a spirit of mission, a spirit of evangelism. So there it is. Wind, fire, water, and tongues. And I'll leave you with this, with this question. I'd encourage you to consider your life and where your life is right now. And ask the Lord, like, where's one area in my life where I, I need more of your spirit? Where's something going on where, Lord, I would ask you, your spirit, to do a fresh work in my life. And maybe what you need today is the ruach. You know, maybe there's something in your life that in your, you're just stuck. You, you can't change it. You, you've tried to change it a hundred times, but you don't have the power within yourself. And you need the power of that mighty wind to come and just breathe and blow in your life because you can't do it. And today's the day to say, Lord, I, I need you. I need your spirit to do a fresh work. Maybe there's some sin in your life that you've been holding on to. Maybe you've compromised in some way and you've been living in that for a long time. But today you realize, Lord, I need your fire. (laughs) I need the fire of your spirit to come and purify me. Burn away my desire for that sin. Take it away, Lord. Give me a greater passion for you.
Maybe that's what it is for you. Uh, maybe you're just going through a dry time. Maybe you're not excited about God. We all go through different seasons, and maybe this is a season of dryness, and um, that passion isn't there. That hunger for the Lord isn't there like it was once. And maybe your prayer this morning is, Lord, would you bring the refreshing, that water, that, that refreshment? It just feels, life just feels dry. My spiritual life just feels kind of dead right now. I need, I need you to refresh me. I can't do it myself. I need your spirit to do it. And then finally, maybe God puts someone on your heart today that you could encourage with your words. Maybe it's somebody in this room. Maybe it's someone in your family. Maybe it's someone who doesn't know Jesus, uh, who you really care about and you love. Um, but you've been maybe scared to share your faith with them. And so maybe today's the day where you say, Lord, I need your spirit to give me courage. I need your spirit to give me words. Give me an opportunity. Open my eyes to an opportunity. Help me just to step into that moment and just be just share what I've learned about you. Whatever it is, uh, this is Pentecost Sunday. And whatever we need, this is one of God's greatest gifts to us, his own spirit. So let me invite us to a time of prayer and let me just pray for you all and pray for a fresh work of the Spirit in your lives and in your church community. Would you pray with me? Well, Father, today as we remember Pentecost, we want to just give you thanks. Your Spirit is, is, apart from Jesus, the greatest gift in the whole universe. What could be better than your own presence living inside of us? You're powerful, you're gracious, you're kind, you're transforming, you're refreshing presence in our lives, Lord. And so we give you thanks. And I pray for this church community. I pray that your spirit would do fresh work in their hearts. Lord, open their eyes to your scriptures. Open their eyes to your presence with them each day. Give them courage. Give them refreshment. Purify them. Give them conviction of sin. Remind them of the goodness of the gospel of your grace. Whatever it is that each one of us needs this morning, Lord, your spirit is the ultimate answer to that. So come, Ruach of God, again, breathe, blow, burn, refresh, and embolden. We give you all the glory, Father, for your, the gift of your Son and the gift of your Spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that uh, clearly explained the questions are up to us. We pray that the creative power of God, the Holy Spirit, the purifying effect, the refreshing blessing, and the call to declare the wonders of God uh, upon our hearts and to decide to obey. We close now with a closing hymn, again prayerfully trusting the Lord that as we ask him for the showers of blessings, that truly he will bless us together. Shall we stand if you are able and we'll sing there shall be showers of blessings. And after that, I will again ask Dr. Zimba to dismiss us in prayer with God's blessing as a benediction. There shall be showers of blessings, and while standing, Dr. Zimba will pray, and then the ushers will direct us how to go.
we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your word which has been declared to us this morning. We receive your word with thanksgiving in our hearts for our prayer that you join us. Change our hearts, O God, that we may be so focused on your gospel. Lord, our lives are meant to save. Lord, they are meant to love you. We pray that as we go to our various homes, may we go with the thought that indeed you have empowered us. That we will proclaim your word uh, without fear. Because we know greater is he who is in us than who is in the world. We thank you, we give you glory. Father, we pray. Pour your showers of blessings on us. Pour your showers of blessing on us that God will have a heart for us. Go before us, we pray and ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated.